roll 20, I'm going to make a custom monster um, in roll 20. Um, I was actually going to build a custom monster for like a build challenge that was going on in Discord. And I started using the tools, um, the D&D Beyond and all that. And I was like, if I ever want to use this monster in a game, I'm going to have to do this in Roll20. So I figured, why don't I just build the monster in Roll20 to begin with? Um, so this is just going to be me showing you how I build monsters in Roll20. Uh, all right, so the first step is build a server for yourself, especially if you DM a lot, um, and call it like Monster Manual. Um, I have this one called 5e Monster Manual. It is just a Roll20 server for monsters. Um, basically, it allows me to build monsters and then use the transmog tool and grab those monsters and import them into my other games. Uh, so how do I have these awesome custom beast uh, tokens for my druids and my other games? I build them all here, and then I only have to build them that one time, and then I can import them into my other games whenever I need them. Uh, over time, my goal is, of course, to fill this server up with just all the custom tokens and custom monsters from all my different games. Uh, and then I can just sort of go here whenever I need monsters and uh, drag them over. Um, also, it's a great place to test out their abilities uh, without spoiling stuff for your players. Uh, because sometimes you'll be building a cool monster um, and you will accidentally click on one of their abilities. And now the players have that in chat, uh, sort of a spoiler of what's going on. So, um, I am building today uh, a horrible fey creature. It is a spider. Um, the artwork uh, is this. It's pretty horrible. Um, I found it on the internet because, I mean, where else would you find this? And I was immediately like, that is, uh, that is horrible. Um, and I've been sort of sitting around trying to figure out what kind of monster would this be? Like, I wanted it to be some kind of fey monster, but I wasn't sure what sort of fey monster I wanted it to be. Um, so then I was playing uh, Indivisible. And the first, I guess, real big boss in Divisible is a spider. Uh, and that spider is named Pindyar, I think. And Pindyar um, is the collector of limbs. It's a very kingdom death sounding monster. Um, it basically hunts other creatures and uses its limbs to build its body. Now, Indivisible is kind of... Um, I guess kid friendly um, in its aesthetic. So while this is horrifying to look at, it's not nearly as horrifying as that, or nearly as horrifying as anything from, say, Kingdom Death. Um, but it got me thinking, like, yeah, all right, a spider-like monster that steals limbs, like that. That's hype. Um, so I was like, okay, let's let's go ahead and do this. Um, so I went ahead and made myself a miniature. Let me save that out real quick. Uh, let's see. Uh, Pindyar. There we go. And I like big monsters. I cannot lie. So I am going to make this big monster. Um, huge. There we go. Anytime, roll 20. Mm. Mm -hmm. There we go. It's really not even that big of a file size. All right. So, huge creatures, three by three. So, there we go. It's pretty cute. All right. Now, I want this to be a legendary monster. I want it to be really tough. So you could do um, add um, new character sheet, make sure that character sheet's an NPC, blah, 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 blah. Um, but it's easier sometimes. And this is something I learned back in 4th edition. 4th edition was the reskin to win um, edition. 
Uh, it even had a very special character builder program that you could automatically use to scale up and down any monster to be any CR. And you could take multiple monsters and mash them together to make new monsters. Uh, 4E was really ahead of its time with a lot of the web tools and stuff like that. It's a real shame uh, that, you know, people treat it so badly. Uh, so I figure this is going to have some poison. So we'll do a green dragon. So I'm going to do, uh, let's say, an adult green dragon. That sounds pretty good. So I'll drag over an adult green dragon. And then I'm going to open up its character sheet. So I hold down Alt and I double click on it. And that opens up the character sheet. So I don't want to mess up the green dragon. So I'm going to go to edit. I'm going to scroll all the way to the bottom. Uh, oops, sorry. I'm going to scroll all the way to the middle. There we go. And I'm going to hit duplicate. I just hit it one time. There's no thing to let me know that I it did it or not. But I'm going to hit save. And then I can close out of this one. And I'm going to scroll this way. All the way to the bottom of my journal. And you should see copy of adult green dragon. So now if I click on that. I can start editing copy of adult green dragon. And this will allow me to make changes to it. So first thing I'm going to do is going to remove that art. I'm going to put in my own art. Well, sorry. I'm going to put in this beautiful art from the game that I've turned into a token. Uh, just so that I don't get as confused about what is what. There we go. And then I'm going to change its name. All right. Um, I could add some tags here that might help me later. So boss, spider, fey. Um, and every time I hit the comma button uh, on the keyboard, it basically hits enter and does another thing for me, which is pretty cool. Um, yeah, so that works. Boss, spider, fey. I'll remove this token and we'll add a new token in later. And then if I wanted to, I could clean up this bio section, hit my cursor down there, I hit control A, I delete everything. I hit backspace to make sure everything's out of there. And I will just copy from the Indivisible Wiki. They got a pretty good description of it. Uh, here we go. The Pindiar is a Vitella found at the edge of, or the end of the Temple Ruins. So I can get rid of that part. And I could just put a horrible fey creature uh, said to live in forests and jungles. All right, uh, let's see. And I need to get rid of the formatting here, which I think, hmm, there we go. Remove formatting. All right, and remove formatting. All right, cool. So I hit save. And now it's no longer a green dragon, right? Sweet. So now I can go to character sheet and I can start changing stuff out. There'll be a gear in the top, top right. If I click on that, I can change the name. And this is not a dragon anymore. It is a fey. And I would say this is not a lawful evil creature. It's probably more like a neutral evil creature because it really only cares about itself. Um, uh, armor, I feel like 19 is pretty generous i mean it's got a carapace or whatever and it's but it's built out of like hodgepodge parts so i feel like a 19 is definitely going to be too high so i'm going to lower that to like a 15 hit points and stuff eh you know basically there is no right answer for this if you're going to make this a solo monster you're going to scale the hit points based on your individual groups dps or sorry dpr damage per round and um size so um we'll just leave that alone for now uh this creature cannot fly but it would be pretty cool to give it a climb speed uh climb speed should probably be equal to its walking speed because it wouldn't make sense otherwise um i would probably say this creature cannot swim all right right now this thing is super strong um 23 is really high I don't think that's necessarily a bad thing. It is a huge creature. It has many, many arms and legs. Uh, so we could probably just leave that for now. 
Um, Constitution is beefy. That makes sense. It's made out of a bunch of other creatures. I don't really anticipate this thing being very smart. I mean, it's crafty, but uh, is it like a you know like a super genius? Is it is it uh, an eighteen? Probably not. So give it like a twelve. Um, it is probably pretty wise. I guess wise would be more like crafty. So yeah, we'll leave it there. Uh, charismatic. I mean, it steals body parts from people and is an ambush predator. I don't really think it worries about being too charismatic, but we'll lower that to a 12. Uh, that would, of course, cause a shift in um, these right here. You could see that based on its hit dice and all of that, it has a plus five uh, proficiency bonus to its saves, which is insane. Um, but only the ones that you grant it proficiency with. Now, dragons, of course, are very tough, so this has a lot of good saving throws here. Um, it would not be inappropriate uh, to give it a high charisma because uh, you don't want it to get banished too easily. And a wisdom is always nice because you don't want it to get janked up by all those different mind-affecting spells and whatnot, so we can leave that uh, relatively high. So 16 is a plus three so that would put that at an eight uh we'll leave intelligence alone uh proficiency and constitution and eh, that makes sense uh dexterous it's a spider sure that makes sense so basically we're still pretty dang tough as far as that goes deception i don't think this guy's gonna be or girl or creature is gonna be fooling anybody Perceptive, it has stolen body parts, so it makes sense for it to have a bunch of eyeballs and stuff. So I could see that being a thing. Uh, let's see. It looks like they ha it gave them expertise, I want to say. Yeah. Um, so that would actually give it a 13 if we kept expertise, which is extremely generous. But hey, it's an ambush predator. Its whole life is about ambushing stuff. Uh, stealth, even though it's so big, a plus six is pretty funny. I mean, you're either going to have a group that will always see where everything is hidden or never see. It seems to be uh, how it goes. Um, you're like, there's always a chance you're going to have that uh, character that has a, you know, 24 passive perception and there are no surprises left uh, sort of thing. All right. It's not persuasive. We'll keep insight because that's kind of cool. Um, and since it does live out in the woods and like to trap people, maybe we'll give it some survival as well. So that would be a plus eight because of its increased wisdom. All right. Uh, damage vulnerabilities. All right. Damage vulnerabilities seem super fun. We all played Pokemon and video games. We love it when a boss is weak against something. Um, the problem is they could be so unbalancing for your fight to have vulnerabilities. It's a big reason why a lot of stuff in 5e doesn't bother to have vulnerabilities. Uh, 5e was crazy about, or sorry, 3e was crazy about vulnerabilities. 4e got really mathematical about resistances and stuff like that. Um, and vulnerabilities, it was more like a passive, like extra five damage, extra 10 damage. Um, most stuff again in 5e doesn't have damage vulnerabilities yeah it's a spider fire that'd be kind of cool but you, it sounds cool but in practice they're just gonna roast your boss and that'll be the end of your boss um right now it's got immunity to poison and the poison condition as a big spider that kind of makes sense what i'm thinking is because of its strange ability to affix body parts to itself it should probably have resistance to necrotic that would be kind of cool all right, it is not a spellcasting NPC, um, and uh, it doesn't have reactions, but if you have a group of five or more, you definitely want to give it reactions, um, and we'll talk about that later, so I'm going to check that box on. It has three legendary actions. Um, that's fine. That's great. Uh, and then the way I have my game set up, I always roll for advantage. I never whisper my rolls, and I always roll damage to crit because I love seeing how hard something could have hit if it had connected with the characters. Uh, and we'll hide the name and the roles just to keep it a little bit more mysterious. So that handles this top section. And we could always come back and add to it if we want to. Like, here you go. You can see that it says common and draconic. We actually want that to say Sylvan. 
All right. So let's see. This is not an amphibious uh, creature, but this creature does have webs. So what we want to do is we want to go ahead and grab uh, a spider. Yeah, so let's. Uh, this is where we're kind of mashing other creatures together to make what we're looking for. So I'm going to go ahead and grab a giant spider, drag him out. And I say this a bunch, but I'll say it again. If you're ever curious, like, what should I buy to make Roll20 easier to use? Buy monster manuals. Monster manuals are the, the most bang for your buck, the best investment you can make. Buy monster manuals. Buy monster manuals. This is going to make your life a lot easier. Um, the amount of monsters available in a product is one of the main reasons why I buy a product. Um, yeah, it makes life so much easier. Uh, all right, so we're going to give our spider all of these spider abilities because we want this to be like the ultimate spider. So I'm going to go in here and give it spider climb instead of amphibious. So I just copy and paste that in. There we go. And let's see, legendary resistance. Sure, sure. Uh, we want this to say Pindyar instead of dragon. That way nobody knows that we secretly copied our dragon. Uh, let's see. And we'll give it web sense because, again, ultimate spider. You don't want to bog it down with too many abilities, um, but, you know. Uh, don't overwhelm yourself, but you definitely want to give yourself some options, you know? It's better to have this stuff written down up front than have to wing it later. And as an ambush predator, it would have spider webs all over its layer, and then use those to know exactly where its prey is. So that's kind of cool. Alright. And let's see. We'll add that here. Uh, web walker and of course you want to you're going to jank up its layer with all kinds of webs uh, and difficult terrain so that'll be cool all right so now we're going to skip over reactions and legendary actions we're going to save those for later we're going to go to its actual abilities so what does a giant spider have it has a, a poisonous bite uh, what does a dragon start with? Multi-attack. Multi-attack is never a bad idea. Uh, a dragon does have frightful presence. Um, we could come up with something similar for this if we really wanted to capture the dragon-esque uh, uh, thing of it. But how about we do... Um, hmm, I want to keep it similar to the monster in the game. The monster in the game really didn't have a lot going on for it. It was like one of the earlier bosses. Um, yeah, it was able to just sort of jump around and everything. Uh, how about this? Uh, it could move a lot. So we'll say the Pindyar uh, can move up to its speed. Woohoo, there we go. Uh, during this movement, it can make three attacks. That's going to be nasty. Uh, it can make three attacks. All right, so one with its bite and two with its claws. This creature has a lot of limbs, so maybe we should give it more, or maybe that should be where the legendary actions and reactions come in. That, that might actually work. Um, if you give it a lot of attacks, you definitely want to lower the damage that those attacks deal. If um, you're playing in a game with extreme critical hits or critical hit cards, the more attacks you have, the more likely someone is to get wrecked um, because eventually a critical hit will land um, so that's a tricky thing to, to, to figure out uh, also it doesn't matter how big your group is if a monster with five attacks manages to get up on that wizard um, and the wizard does not cast shield uh, they will die because five attacks is a lot of attacks um, it will it'll mess them up pretty good uh, so i think for now we will just do that, and we won't call them claws. We'll call them stolen hands, because that sounds so much grosser. All right, 
So the bite will stay bite, um, and it has a really long reach uh, because it's a huge creature. Now, if you look at the artwork of the Pindyar, it does not look like it has a very long stretchy neck. So we might say it does not have long reach with its bite. So we'll lower that. Uh, but I would like it to hit pretty hard. A 2d10 plus 6 is pretty insane. 2d6 poison. I like it. I like it. Let's see. What does the spider have to offer for poison? Uh, nothing fancy going on there. Uh, what about our friend the crypt spider? Let's uh, double click that to minimize it. You can still see it's there, but I minimized it by double clicking the top of it. A very cool feature of roll 20. Crypt spiders have a nasty ability uh, with their poison. Um, they can create zombies. Mm, that's hype. Um, I feel like a creature that steals limbs, though, isn't going to need to worry about that. And they can also cocoon prey. That's something that we want to steal. Because this creature currently does not have a bonus action. And in, generally with your bosses, especially with solo bosses, you want to give them every opportunity uh, you can to completely abuse their action economy. Uh, so there we go. As a bonus action, a Crypt Spider. So we'll say as a bonus action, uh, the Pindyar uh, can cocoon a creature with uh, within five feet that is currently restrained by webbing. A cocoon creature has disadvantage on ability checks and saving throws made to escape from the web. All right, I dig it. Uh, let's see. Then we will call this Stolen Hands. Oh, yeah, I was looking for a poison that would be really good. I could have sworn, like, the spider, when it bit you, you, like, couldn't do anything afterwards. I know that's, like, straight out of, like, Lord of the Rings, but I could have sworn the poison. Ah, here we go. Um, and the target must make... Here we go. All right, so... Let's go back to the bite before we continue with stolen hands. And the target must make a DC. What is the DC of the dragon's abilities? An 18. Good lord. All right. Uh, let's see. The target must make a DC 18 constitution saving throw. And oh, wow. OK, so we can remove that. No, we'll change it to be. 2d8 poison up there. Okay, cool. Uh, on a fist or half as much as successful. If the poison damage reduces the target zero hit points, the target is stable but poisoned for one hour, even after regaining hit points, and is paralyzed while poisoned this way. Ugh, that's going to be brutal. Okay, we'll leave it in. It's fantastic. All right. So now we've got a real nasty uh, bite ability. All right, so going on to Stolen Hands. Uh, stolen Hands, they reach out, they grab you. I'm going to give that a 10-foot reach instead of the bite because I'm going to say that the limbs are like uh, multiple joints and hands holding onto arms, holding onto more arms that stretch out. It's like really nasty. Um, let's see. I don't think they would do slashing because they're... Um, just hands. So we'll do bludgeoning. There we go. And I don't want it to do as much damage there. So we're going to drop that to 1d8. Yeah. Uh, with the caveat that um, if the Pindiar hits the same target with both or sorry, with two stolen hand attacks. That creature is grappled and restrained. Uh, and then the DC would be based on its strength, so DC 16. Sweet. And this is kind of cool, because there's still a chance in hell, I guess, that they won't get restrained by it, but pretty neat. Uh, 
Let's see what else. Stolen hands. Uh, it doesn't have a tail. Uh, you know what it does have though? Uh, it has a has a flipping um, crossbow built into its back. Uh, for, I guess it stole a crossbow from somebody. So, or maybe just a bow and arrow. Uh, so we will call that um, instead of tail. This will be uh, chitinous longbow. There we go. And this is going to be a ranged attack, which means it's not going to be very good at hitting things. So, let's see. Um, get rid of giant spider for now. Yeah. His dexterity is only a plus one. Whereas his other one's a plus six. And his proficiency is a five. So this chitinous longbow is only going to have a six to attack. Um, and it's only going to do 2d8 plus 1 piercing. And we technically need the reach for it. Um, let's see. Hobgoblin has a longbow built in. Or you could just look it up in the, you know, compendium or the player's handbook, whatever. Uh, let's see. Hobgoblin. What's the range on that uh, sweet longbow? Jesus. 150 to 600 feet. Okay. Mm -hmm. Alright, so we'll also have this do some poison damage as well. So it's nasty if it hits, but it may or may not hit. And I think we will go ahead and add that to its multi-attack. So the Pindyar can move its speed during this movement. It can make three attacks. Uh, so we'll say four attacks. Uh, one with its bite. Two with its stolen hands. And one with its chitinous longbow. All right. Oh, that's nasty. All right. Uh, let's see. It doesn't have a frightful presence, so we can get rid of that. And it doesn't have a breath weapon, so we can get rid of that. All right, but it—you know what? It does still need. It needs a web attack. So, so, let's see. Which of you has a good web attack? There you go. Web. Uh, let's see. On hit. That's all it says. Just on hit. Cool. Uh, let's see what this spider has to say. Okay, it also just says on hit. Uh, web, here we go. So, to add a new attack, I'll hit that plus sign that was right there. Just show you again. Okay, or not. There's a little plus right here. You can just click that and it'll add a new one. Uh, we're going to call this uh, web, and this spider will not need to recharge its web. It will just have webbing. And this is a ranged attack, so we click on attack, we go to range, and let's see. It's got a terrible dexterity, so this web is only at a plus six to hit, and it's only against one target. Uh, we'll give it, yeah, 3060 sounds fair for how far it can shoot it. It does no damage, uh, but the target is restrained by webbing. All right, so we'll go ahead and put that information down here. Uh, so if they're hit, the target is restrained by webbing. As an action, the restrained target can make a DC, and we'll raise this to 16. Uh, strength check bursting from the webbing on a success. Uh, the webbing can also be attacked and destroyed. The AC is 10. And let's make this a little bit beefier webbing. So we'll raise that to like a 14 with 15 hit points. The vulnerability to fire, immunity to bludgeoning, poison, and psychic damage. Sweet. All right. So far, so good. This creature is looking pretty nasty. Now... We've got a bonus action they could use, and it's always good to remind yourself that it's a bonus action by labeling it real big. There you go. And I might even move that to the top of the list. There we go. 
Alrighty. So, um, legendary actions. What can this thing do for its legendary actions? Detect is pretty slick, just like a dragon. Um, so it could kind of keep track of prey in its lair. Um, I would say that web would definitely be one. So, uh, the uh, MTR. Or sorry, Pindiar. There we go. There's no T. Pindiar uh, uses its web attack. So that means in between turns, it could be webbing people up all over the place, which is pretty sweet. Um, it could detect people who may or may not be there. And then we will call this a flourish of limbs. And it will cost up two action points, but. Uh, let's see. The Pindiar uh, may make one stolen limb attack against every creature uh, of its choice within range. As a huge creature, that could be a lot of creatures. So this thing basically just starts spinning around with all of its limbs just going after everybody. I dig it. All right. The Pindyar may make one stolen limb attack against every creature of its choice within range. Hmm. Hype. Okay. And then we'll keep detect and we'll say the Pindyar. Now, usually, I like a boss to have a movement based ability as one of its three legendary actions. But there's not a need for it, I think, because we gave it movement as part of its multi-attack. So um, it already can take a movement, take a bonus action, and then move and then attack during the movement. So it already has quite a bit going on for it right there. Um, as far as reactions go, um, if you didn't want to make it, uh, give it a layer action, um, this would be a good time to basically give it an ability to make ads. Um, in the video game, um, Indivisible, when you fight this thing, um, side-scrolling, Metrovania-style boss, um, it stops fighting you at certain points and magically jumps away, because video game. And then it starts raining down poison uh, or... Uh, baby spiders at you and the baby spiders are absolute trash but you know what a creature made of limbs would spawn that is also kind of like a spider crawling hands yeah so we do some crawling claws here oh yeah mm, delicious so uh these crawling claws are hot trash but uh, if you're playing with flanking, whether the plus two bonus or the um, really insane um, advantage uh, version, they can definitely set the creature up for success. Also, they can, just like a familiar, use their action to do an assist. And with that assist, they can um, uh, they can basically grant advantage as well. So even though they have a challenge rating of zero, um, they help that action economy as well because uh, this creature can only use legendary actions outside of its turn. Um, having more creatures on the initiative count will give it a, the ability to do that. So we will have its reaction be the following. Um, hands uh, knocked loose. So basically, um, when... The Pindiar uh, takes damage. It can spawn uh, crawling hands in its own space or any adjacent space. The amount of hands spawned is 1d4 plus 1 for every 10 damage taken 
from the attack. Hype. Um, so that could be especially punishing if the DM waited till they got hit with a real big attack. They could spawn a whole bunch of these nasties, um, which is awesome. And then if you wanted to save yourself a little bit of time, you could put double square brackets around that D4, and then it'll automatically roll it for you when you click on it. Because you can actually click on reactions now, which is cool. See? Hands not loose. When the Pindyar takes damage, it could spawn crawling hands in its own space uh, or any adjacent space. Uh, let's also say um, these uh, crawling hands, or sorry, crawling claws uh, are treated as fey, comma, not undead. There we go. I like it. All right. And just like that, we have created an absolutely monstrous uh, creature for our party to fight. <sighs> um, is the creature still a challenge rating 15? Mm, yeah, probably. Um, I don't feel like we took too much away. I mean, it, it lost that breath weapon. The breath weapon was, you know, pretty good. It's a green dragon, though. And green dragons combat wise are kind of underpowered compared to other dragons because everybody and their mom is like resistant to or immune to poison um so poison as an attack is not very good this creature also uses poison so um that's you know kind of in the same boat but compared to a dragon of similar strength and level this one has a much better action economy in that it can move twice per turn attack four times per turn um, it can bonus action, um, completely restrain a target who has been webbed. Uh, yeah, so it's, it's pretty good stuff. Uh, let's see. Cocoon creatures is currently streaming with a cocoon creature. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So it can do a super restraint essentially off of the Crypt Spider's ability. It could climb on the ceiling if it wants to and then only use its crossbow and its ranged uh, webbing uh, if it feels that that would be advantageous for the beginning of the fight. Also, you're going to be hopefully dropping this on them in a layer where they there's webbing everywhere so the creature can use terrain to its advantage as well. Um, overall, it's going to be an amazing monster to drop on some group at some point. Um, but it also fulfills uh, my desire to build a spider made out of stolen human parts. Um, so, yeah. And that is that is how I would do it if I was uh, building a monster. And again, I did not address the hit points here. I feel like that's a decent amount of hit points. Uh, if I had a group that was spec'd for DPS, I might, of course, raise the hit points. If I had a group that actually let their uh, party assassin assassinate things, and the party assassin could get past a passive perception of 23, which any decent assassin could, and they dropped an assassinate round on the creature, I would obviously want uh, ahead of time to have given the creature enough hit points to still be a boss monster after that whole fiasco um yeah now to sort of hint at the hands at the beginning of the fight i might as i'm rolling into initiative um have i don't know like one crawling claw per player character um sort of drop off of the main body to sort of hint that like hey this this creature can make more creatures um so i would definitely keep the crawling claw handy eh, um, for the battle uh, because you're going to be using it quite a bit all right but anyways that's my advice if you're building a creature in roll 20 um don't don't reinvent the wheel um think about in your massive collection of monsters that you already have do i have anything that is close to what i want to make and if you do then uh for the love of God, just go grab that monster and duplicate it and change it out. There's no reason to do everything from scratch. All right. Uh, hopefully this video on making monsters was helpful for you. Oh, wait, wait, wait. I could, I'll show you real quick how to attach it. There you go. So um, 
I'll go to uh, this options one last time. I'll show you token size is right here, uh, right towards the bottom above reactions and all that. Token size means how many squares. So three would be three by three. So this token is the right size uh, for a huge creature. So I am going to uh, double click on it without holding down any buttons. I'm going to go to represents and I'm going to look for the pin DR. There we go. I'm going to do show nameplate for myself because then I can remember what to call this thing. I'm going to go to the red bar, bar number three. It's different for everybody, but I prefer red for hit points. And I'm going to punch in 207 out of 207. But then I'm going to go back to it and set it to none. Uh, the reason for this is there's no linking hit points to NPC character sheets. So... Um, if I had the hit points linked like that, and God forbid they fought two of these creatures or three of these creatures, if I had linked the hit points, the hit points would be shared across all of the instances of that monster, and that would be a real pain in the ass. So you definitely want to set your hit points back to no value, or which is none, when you're done. Now, for AC, you don't do AC, you do NPC underscore AC, and that will grab the AC from the monster. Uh, then we're going to go over to advanced, and I don't want my players to see any of its cool stuff. If it had an aura, I would want to have that turned on so the players could see its aura. Um, I do want the minion to be able to see. This creature has 60 feet of dark vision and 120 feet, or sorry, 60 feet of blind sight and 120 feet of dark vision, which is a great example here because 120 would be the furthest it could see. And then it would only start to go dim after 60 feet. There we go. Save all those changes. Uh, now, while it's still selected with those uh, eight uh, little blue squares surrounding it and the little lollipop handle at the top, I'm going to go back to the character sheet. I'm going to hit edit and I'm going to say use selected token. This is crucial uh, because if you set up the miniature, but you don't register it to the character sheet. Um, when you go to pull the character sheet out onto the table, uh, it will not remember what the miniature is. Uh, and if you ever have to change anything about the miniature, you have to re-register it to the character sheet. Uh, but now that we've done that, if I go over to my game and I've got the pin DR, I can drag out as many pin DRs as I want, like so. And each of them has their own unique hit point pool that doesn't impact the others. Uh, but on any of them, I can hold down Alt, double click, and I will open up the character sheet for them. So now, from start to finish, you've seen how to build your own custom monster in Roll20. And I hope that has been helpful uh, to you.